G'day legends, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast where we talk to rad humans doing rad things in the mountain biking industry. For this one, we have a uh, pretty cool uh, committed mechanic uh, by the name of Daniel Payne, aka Major Payne. Um, he is currently Jack Moyer's mechanic. He's been Jack Moyer's mechanic in the past. Been a bit up and down with what he's been doing in his life and we chat about everything, which is pretty rad. Before we jump into the episode though, I'd love to thank... Uh, my sponsors, first up, we've got Trek Bikes. These guys uh, keep the podcast rolling in a huge way, and I'm still absolutely loving my slash. Looks like there's going to be a few new things coming from those guys throughout the year, so I'm, I'm super excited for the, the rest of 2023 with those crew. Frank Brown Bike Apparel just dropped a new purple range. Uh, I'm still loving their kit, and I'm still, yeah, can't say enough about them. Don't forget to use Beyond the Tape 10 at checkout when you're checking those guys out, because you get a bit of a discount. Shred Bike just sent me some goodies. I'm absolutely loving their stuff. Keeps the sh- uh, slash nice and clean. Super easy to use. Environmentally friendly. Love it. Fist Handwear have been keeping the hands protected. And as we come into the summer season, the warming gloves are coming off and we're going on to the breezes. So if you want some of the best handwear in the world, check out fisthandwear.com. Taylor Trails uh, offer you the best experience when you get down to riding in Tasmania. Hit them up, tell them how many people you got, and they'll sort everything out for you so you can just go down there, ride, drink beer, and eat pizza. Lead Out Sports, uh, one of the best uh, distributors when it comes to tools and everything you need to work on your bike, plus a few components and everything else. Check out the full range of Pedro stuff because you'll get no better value for money. Dirt Surf Australia, keeping the mud out of my eyes and hopefully the dust off my stanchions throughout summer. Capped out caps, uh, keeping my stem looking amazing uh, with their custom top caps. And man, eyes are never happier uh, than when they're in some Oakley Sunnies. So thanks everyone uh, for listening to this one. Um, Go visit those sponsors, support them because they support us. Enjoy this episode with Painy and yeah, as per usual, grab beer, grab a water, grab a wine, grab whatever makes you happy and enjoy the podcast. Glad that could work for the both of us. Where are you flying out to on the weekend? Um, off to Nuremberg, um, where the HQ is for YT. Yep. Um, so go there and just piece a bike together. Um, we've sort of got a bike that's um, predominantly built, just a, a few bits and pieces that Jack had to take home. Um, so yeah, go piece that together and get it ready. And then um, I'll go pick up Jack and Stagsy, I think in, I think in Geneva. Okay. Yeah. Sick. Yeah. When's the yeah. next race again? I don't even remember. Um, Luden VR. Um, I think it's the first weekend in September. Okay. But, yeah, right. um, yeah, they're going to come over a little bit, a little bit early. Um, and we'll just do a bit of riding. Um, well, Jack will do a bit of riding. Hopefully I'll get to, <laughs> have a spin as well. You don't get to do much riding when you're out out on the wrenches, hey? Not really. Um, like, gonna try and make a real effort this this trip. Like, um, like at Worlds, um, I sort of went to help out and maybe get a little bit of riding in, and um, uh, just you know, fill in fill in where I needed, like put the help put the pits up and pack down all that sort of stuff and one one other we um uh johnny thompson um from fit for racing is the performance manager um for yt and he was like all right let's let's go for a ride we sort of all looked at each other and we're like oh we've got dinner like we're gonna do all this stuff and and then sort of a few of us just made it happen like we skipped dinner went for a bike ride it was real fun and we end up having like a super super late dinner at McDonald's or whatever, but it was just <laughs> so like refreshing. And I think that you just need to make it happen. Like it's, it's not easy, but if you make it happen, it's a real positive thing. Mm. I think George, are you happy to just kind of keep going and, and call this episode or <laughs> is there anything you want to know? Yeah. Happy, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, um, 
yeah, do what it, do whatever. Yeah. It's fine. So, um, yeah. I think Jordi Cortez was saying like the same thing. He tries to make it a, a thing where he actually goes for a ride at events and stuff because otherwise you just end up in the same room and you're in the same tent and you're in the same people and you kind of forget where you are. Yep. Those guys seem to to do it really well from the outside looking in. Like um, you see them on their bike sort of like in, in the morning and stuff like that. And um, like at Fort William, they were riding back to their ACOM and stuff. Like it, even though it might only just be a short ride or something like that, it's like that you see them making the effort. It's cool. Um, so yeah, were you just doing stuff for the YT athletes at, at Worlds? Yeah, so um, like uh, Oshin and Sean, um, they have their mechanics and like all the staff around that like um, they have their normal program basically. Mm-hmm. So they, they pitted um, with YT and all that sort of stuff. And so like I'm not help, help, like helping them um, so much. Like I'm just another person around the pits to talk to. Um but we had a couple of athletes that are sponsored and also um, sort of are in with YT. Um, so, for example, um, um, who I just sort of like helped at the top of the, the track with um, like a warm-up and training, did bolt check and stuff on on his bike. Um, he is uh, an R&D rider for YT. Okay. Um, and then Potty, who has raced and sort of been sponsored by um, YT for a, a long time now, um, uh, South African rider. He, I just sort of like, I, I didn't even really help them. I just where I was needed, I just sort of stepped up. Mm. They they had their bikes predominantly built and stuff like that. They needed a couple of brake bleeds, and so I just I just helped out literally. Not yeah. not anything. Um, yeah, too much. Is it pretty cool to chill and, and relax throughout the weekend a little bit more? Yeah. One one breakfast, um, I think it was like the first day for maybe track walk or something like that. And um, we didn't even have to start to sort of like leave breakfast till 9 a.m. And uh, I made a bit of a, a joke um, at the table. I was like, oh, how chilled is this week? Like obviously like the riders and stuff, like you guys have a lot of pressure on you know, to build throughout the week, but it's quite relaxing. And um, Gunnar, our team manager, um, sort of like laughed and looked over and he's like, yeah, it's all right for you. Like everyone else is doing their job. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I had, a, I had a pretty chilled week. Like um, it was really nice to get on tr- like on the track and watch some of the um, riding and, um, yeah, just, I don't know, enjoy – I still spent a lot of time in the pits. I, I think because I like out with people in our team. But um yeah, it was it was much different to the normal scenario. Mm. I think everyone at like when I saw the team in um in Tassie, everyone looked like they were just having good vibes and just enjoyed being in the in the pits. Yeah. Yeah. Um everyone gets along really well, um, which is a little bit surprising. Like, I was sort of like a little nervous at the start of the year, just um, like I guess the whole German stereotype. Um, and, yeah, we have a lot of a lot of Germans and stuff on the team, but, um, yeah, everyone's fantastic. Um, like you would have seen the, the enduro side, I guess, um, yeah. and a lot of the staff do – do cross over um mm. but yeah even like um a couple of well actually i think there's only one one person from the downhill team that doesn't cross over which is george O'Sheen's mechanic yeah okay um and he lives here in the uk um and yeah like i get along with him really well and like everyone does like it's yeah so it's it's really cool to there's just no place for um, people not to get along in teams anymore. Like, um, mm-hmm. 
feel like everyone needs to be at the top of their game and if you have like little feuds it just it wouldn't work in any team how did the uh, whole yt thing come about for you for for wrenching? um i've i've stayed in contact um with jack for a, a few years now um and when he went to the enduro side um like Canyon had already had a mechanic and all that sort of stuff signed up. So, um, otherwise might've been with him, um, uh, like straight from intense. Um, that was sort of the plan after 2019, but, um, the way it come, came up with, uh, YT is just that, um, I guess, uh, uh, Ben, um, Jack's mechanic from last year, um, I don't believe was able to to do the role um, this year for I think it was personal reasons. Um, and so yeah, Jack was looking for a mechanic, and um, it just happened to work out that I was going to be based in the northern hemisphere this year, which has um, worked out well for for YT. Um, I think like yeah, flying a mechanic. Um, halfway across the world several times is obviously super expensive. Um, and it's great to see that that is happening for a lot of the Aussie mechanics, um, or Aussie riders. Um, that's really cool. But, um, yeah, I just don't think it was something that they necessarily wanted to do. So yeah, just a a few conversations with YT and, and Jack individually and, um, sort of just all lined up. Mm. Yeah, it's cool to see like people are switching on to the whole having a mechanic near your home and in your home country kind of works quite well. Yeah, I still think it's the most positive thing that um, like a, a rider can have um, is yeah, a consistent mechanic. Not only like you can travel with the person and stuff like that too then. Um, that mm. makes it a little bit nicer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just having like support at home um, on a on, on a regular basis. I'm sure it's different for what each mechanic does when they're home. Um, but when I worked with Jack in the past, um, like and I was based in Australia, um, I was there for the whole year. Like uh, yeah. I was employed at, and had a salary for the whole year. Is that different now because you're not kind of working with Jack unless he's raising? Um, so, yes, you still still work on a salary and stuff like that, but um, uh, he has a home mechanic. Um, yeah. Rick Boyer looks after him when he's at home. Yeah. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just done a whole lot differently. Yeah. Good old Ricky. That's going to be wild. <laughs> Yeah, I bumped into him at Worlds actually. He was over having a holiday. Yeah, and, I saw um, that. I didn't yeah, I didn't even realise um kind of social media stuff like um just in just scrolling and it's just mindless. And I didn't even put two and two together that he was there because I had seen some stuff. And then um uh our team manager um pulled me aside and he was just like, Oh, is is Rick here? And I'm like, Oh, I don't know. And um, <laughs> so, yeah, we sent him a message and then five minutes later, 10 minutes later, he was around the pits saying, saying hello. So, yeah, that was that was good. I love how he doesn't take it upon himself to come in and say hi to you guys. <laughs> like, you've got to invite him. It's such a Ricky thing. Well, I, yeah, I, I, that's just... Um, I didn't want to, like, sort of interrupt the flow or anything like that, but I'm sure he was just enjoying his holiday too. Um mm. Yeah, had his had his wife and and son there, and uh, his son was frothing on the races and getting all the uh, the autographs and stuff like Sick. that. So that was that was cool to see. It's so good, so good to see. So before, uh, sorry, sorry, no, you go ahead. Oh, I asked, um, I asked Rick. I was like, oh, how long since you've been been to a World Cup? He was like, oh, probably twenty years or something like that. <laughs> long, long time. <laughs> the last time it was in Canberra, probably. <laughs> oh yeah, actually that's actually I did ask him outside Oz because I knew he would have been to the, oh, okay. the Oz once. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so you were with Jack on the intense team for a while, right? Correct. Yeah, for for 2019. Okay. Was what was that kind of season like for you guys? For you getting was that your first like World Cup season with that team? It or? was. Yeah. 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 I was like, like I've been super lucky with people that have been on these teams and stuff like that. Like it, it was my first first year and like obviously there's so much to learn. Um, not so much like about the bikes and stuff like that, but the way things work, the way the World Cups work, you, you're dealing with nerves um, because you're at the pinnacle of the sport. And um, yeah, John, uh, like in particular, um, John Hall, he just sort of like showed us. Uh, so Sam and I, I think Sam had done a couple of like World Cups and stuff before, but we're both fairly fresh. He just sort of showed us the way things worked and um, he's got a similar mindset uh, to me or I've got a similar mindset. Like we just work similar ways, mm. I think. Um, so, yeah. Like when we mostly had Americans and Canadians on that team. Um, and so there was no language barrier or like um, mm-hmm. anything like that. Just, yeah, everything just worked really well. It was, it was a super cool year. Um, but the actual results and stuff like that, like it was a really tough year. Um, we had some products on the bike that were, not competitive compared mm. to maybe some other brands. And it was, um, yeah, it was really difficult, but I think like it, it also, um, made us think outside the box a little bit and, and try some different pieces. So there was some positive stuff in there as well, as much as the results didn't necessarily come around. I think like the best result we had was maybe ninth in, and Dora, and I think he qualified seventh at, at Worlds, which was like a nice little sort of um, thing just to show the speed was there. Didn't didn't mm. um, necessarily translate over to um, the actual race result, but um, yeah, to be inside the top ten a couple of times, especially on some stuff that was holding him back, was was all right. I was going to say that would have been like a super, super hard year for you to come in as the, the mechanic for your first year. Like the products weren't bad. They just weren't competitive, as you said. Like that's – that, and people right. struggling with them. And and perhaps were you ever like second-guessing yourself or because you would have just come on? And um, then... No, like um, I don't think so because it was – it, maybe if it was just us mm. we're struggling, maybe that would be the case. Um, but I think it was quite clear. And and looking back, and after having conversations and stuff like that now, like it was it was pretty clear. It was a a couple of things in particular. What was it like working next to John and, and Aaron Gwynn? Like they're the one of the power couples in the. In the- in the sport, like yeah, watching those two get yeah. work together would have been wild. Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Um, John's sort of like a knock around bloke. Um, like he's very professional and he, he does his job fantastic. Um, but I mean, just sort of his personality and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so he's easy to get along with, easy to talk to. Um, I was surprised that when I stepped in that there was, um, no ego. Um, I thought that was going to be a big thing on that team. Um, Mm. but no fit, fit right in. Um, and it was, it was really cool. Um, Aaron, um, is very professional, stuck to himself like quite a lot. Um, so as much as I saw Aaron on a daily basis um, and would talk to him, he was 
I want to say closed off, but that's not really like the right way to put it. He just knew what he needed to do and he just went about his way of, of doing things. Um, and I just sort of, sort of, I guess, distanced myself from that just so I didn't get in the way and interrupt anything. Mm. He's a busy so man, was, right? Like he's- <laughs> yeah. I think it was I think it was roughly the time when he was building that big house and stuff as well. So he was like any time that he was away from the track um and not like training and stuff, he was he had like stuff to do with that, whether it was like meetings or like ordering bits and pieces, speaking to like the contractors or, or whatever it may be. He was he was super busy man. And then like obviously that was I think the first year he um was running the team. Mm. And um, so he was busy with sort of uh, sponsor obligations and stuff like that as well. So, yeah, he, I don't know what it's like now, but he was very busy back then. You think you'd kind of get into a flow by now. It's, it's wild, like, that he's running that team and, and everything's going like that way. For sure. And I think there'd probably be a few more pe- uh, people behind the scenes now that do mm. do a lot of work on I don't, I don't know about their, their team too much nowadays, but, um, yeah, you would hope so. So what did you kind of get up to in the Canyon years as Jack was like, obviously he was out uh, dominating Enduro on those and for three years, three years, two years? Y- yeah. So, um, what, 2020, the, um, COVID year, um, and then he had 21, uh, well, well, all of the years were with Canyon, but, um, mm. yeah, uh, 20, 21, 22, um, I didn't work with him. I actually did a bunch of things. So, uh, at the end of 19, um, I just stepped straight back into the, uh, store that I was working at, um, previously. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd done days here and there throughout the, the year and stuff like that and um yeah so I, I just stepped straight back into that um and i was it's funny because you can easily get a little bored or frustrated sort of going back to the shop um or to a shop um mm-hmm. just because you sort of have so much freedom um on the world cup, like you kind of, even though there's a schedule, you do things almost when you want, like, and, Mm. um, yeah, it's just like not a strict, like nine to five in, in any way. Um, even though like the, the level that you're working at, it's like, it is higher, but it's not higher. Like you always want to do the, your best work. It doesn't matter if it's on like, uh, you know, uh, an elderly lady's bike or, or Jack Moyer's bike. Like he's, you always want to do your best, right. But, um, yeah, there is a, there is a difference there. Um, but yeah, got, got a little bored, um, uh, the bike shop just with like the nine to five. And, um, so I just tried some different stuff. Like, um, I worked in a coffee shop for a little bit. Um, Safe. And yeah, knowing like very little about like yeah. in general, it's like one of those things that once you get into um, something new, you realize how big it can actually be. Um, yeah. So yeah, just just like scratch the surface there, uh, but it wasn't my thing. It got very repetitive, like um, making a mm. hundred coffees in an hour on a Saturday morning. Like was cool, but that was the cool bit like one hour a week um yeah yeah uh so then um i worked for a mate's irrigation company um yeah, cool. in that time as well yeah. um and but bikes are my hobby so i always always came back to that i had um some mates uh start up a um new bike shop uh locally to where i was at and so i went and worked with them for a little bit um and that was that was really good. I'd worked in a company a, a long time ago that had just started up like another bike shop. Mm. And it's really, really cool to see people sort of like start something, create something, and then, um, yeah, guide it into, 
to something good. Um, it's good to have then, that that little break from bike. So, like, I'm currently not working in a shop and digging holes, and it's the same same thing as you in the coffee shop. You don't realize how big the industry can get, and and what there is in every little industry. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, sometimes you just need that break, don't you? Like, um, but then, yeah, as a like, as soon as you get back into it, though, like you find the love again. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, as long as you've had that that good enough time, like, um, yeah, that break. And now, like, the the job that I have, I think it would be fair to say, like, working with YT and like this is this is the best job that i've ever had um uh, just like the current situation and stuff like that is fantastic what was the where was the shop that your mates started up was that on in oz or is that overseas in oz yeah yeah yep. so um yeah around the gosford area which is uh about an hour north of of sydney okay um, yeah so yeah, like basically, um, yeah, I, I've lived on the coast a lot of my life. I love that area. It's fantastic. Um, and yeah, worked worked in and around there as well. Like tried to keep, all, always tried to keep work pretty close to home just to try and keep that work-life balance, be able to ride bikes in the afternoon and before mm-hmm. work and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So now north of Sydney is like four or five kilometers, something like that, roughly. What do you mean? Oh, it just takes forever to go anywhere in Sydney. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I was there. For, yeah, no, it's for a bit, yeah. and like went from the airport through Sydney up to the Northern Beaches, and it felt like I'd gone to another state in time wise, but it was like thirty kilometers. It's wild. Yeah. Once you get north of there, it's like God's country. Yeah, yeah. I was so <laughs> surprised. The riding is so different up there. Like everything is so different. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, because you're you're based in Adelaide, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's well, probably my favorite place in Oz to to holiday. I reckon in um, Adelaide. Yeah, I love like because I love road cycling as well, and it's just ah. um absolutely fantastic. Like, um, yeah, can just uh, two down under week is just like one of my favorite weeks. Mm. It's uh. Probably, probably a very close second behind uh, Cannonball Week. That's that's the True. that's the favorite week of the year. I reckon. See a lot of a lot of people that you don't often see get to go race your bike. Dirt burst cool. Yeah, it's like one of those just industry meetings, basically, and everyone actually gets to ride their bike together instead of talk about business. It's sick. Yeah, and you see people from like like you know, 10 years ago that stopped riding bikes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like life sometimes just gets in the, in the way a bit. And, um, and you see like a lot of like those faces coming back and, mm. um, some of them like bring their young families and stuff like that. It's, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Sick. So what was, what led to the move overseas? Was it the job with YT or was it, you obviously got a, a uh, move before that? Yeah, so I I'd moved before that. Um, my partner's uh, from the UK, um, okay. so um, yeah, she'd been living in Australia, um, and basically, um, like a couple of things, uh, well, brought me over here or brought her back. Um, a career, um, mm-hmm. so then, like, basically, the next step in her training was was much better and easier to do over here. Um, and then obviously, uh, to spend time with her family and stuff as well, um, which I think is, is really cool. Like we're in a position that we can, we can do that. Like we haven't got too many ties sort of anywhere. And, um, rather than just come over and visit her family for a couple of weeks, Mm. you know, every year or every couple of years or something like that, um, get to, get to know them like properly and, um, yeah, so just o- over here for a couple of years, really. Was it a culture shock when you go over there to, I guess, ride? Everything's going to be a little bit 
different. Yeah, it's it's funny because I think I think if I talk about it too much, I'll sound like fairly negative. Um, the, <laughs> <laughs> so we we'll get the key points out of the way. Here, rubbish. Um, the riding where I am is actually it's a really flat area, so there's not much mountain biking at all. Yeah. Um, and well, really, that's that's the two sort of like negative points, but. We live in a really nice area. Like um, we are right down south, um, pretty close to Bournemouth or Pool, um, and we have proper beaches. Like it's like proper nice sand. Um, yeah, like it's just really green. Like we we do live in a really good good place. Um, and yeah, like we're we're close to family and stuff like that. So it, it is it's perfect. It's good to be able to just duck over to another country and go ride some weird, cool shit as well. Like, it's so much closer yeah. to everything. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. Um, we in this last block of um, uh, but in between racing, basically, um, we decided to go on a holiday and um about 10 minutes from where we live, you can catch a, a ferry um, with your car across to France. And I was just like the biggest tourist. I was just like, you drive onto this thing and um, I was like, oh, this is so cool. And then, yeah, like four hours later, you're like driving your own car in a different country. And we caught the Euro tunnel back and I was like, oh, like getting on a train to go like to a different country. Like it's, uh, it's funny, like, I'm the biggest tourist. I remember being, because I lived in Germany for six months or something, and we caught a plane to Barcelona, and it took like 30 minutes or something, bullshit like that. And I'm like, surely yeah. we haven't left Germany yet. And they're like, no. we're, we're I'm like, no. We're just, this country <laughs> is just so unbelievably big down here that it completely ruins your perspective for the rest of the world. Yeah. As an Aussie, it's just it's just weird, isn't it? Mm. You, how can you drive across countries? Like it doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you'll you'll drive for I don't know eight ten hours, and you can you can drive across three or four or whatever. Mm. It's like this is this is just the tourist part coming out right now. Like you know, some people listen to this and it's just like normal, but you're like, oh, crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, but then they come down and see a kangaroo, and you're just like, "That's a kangaroo!" <laughs> like, yeah, that's very true. Yeah. What? Um, I guess like, are you working? Were you working other jobs over there as well? Did you get straight into a bike shop, or how did how did that go kind of go about when you moved across to the UK? Yeah, so I didn't have the YT job um, at that time, and so. Um, I jumped in with a, a shop, um, but it was just incompatible with this, this role. Like we take, like we're away for what, like four months of the year kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, to jump in and out, like it's, it's fairly difficult. Like the role I had with the store previously, like in 19, um, I guess you don't realize how lucky you are. Like if they're just like, they just, you know, send you off and just welcome you back whenever. Um, but yeah, some stores aren't necessarily like that. And they, you know, they, they need you there kind of thing. Um, I don't think it matters like what job you have or anything like that. If you're taking four months off, like the, the employer <laughs> like struggles with that. So, um, yeah, basically my, my sole job is um is YT and um even though uh there's a fair bit of uh downtime in the year, like a lot of that does still get used up. Like um there's always something to to organize or um even though maybe the racing isn't um all the time, like there's still things that go on in the background that where you have to like be places and um, mm. have things ready like well early and stuff like that. 
what was it been like test? So this is the first year for Jack on um, YT, and your first time. Correct. But what's it yep. been like? I guess he's a, the cool thing about the YT is you're running your own products, but what's it been like testing wise and getting everything set up and adapting to that new team, like having everything going to happen again, like with what happened at Intense? Like, <laughs> seems to have gone full circle. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, start of the year, um, obviously the bike was new for him. Um, and so, we wanted to try and eliminate as many things as possible just to get him comfortable on the on the actual frame or bike. So um, straight away, we went with uh, basically all of the components that he'd used previously um, or if there was something that he didn't necessarily like from previous, we put something on that, was, that he'd either used or was comfortable with. Um, and we were testing, um, a, we didn't have a test, uh, different front, like front triangles because we knew he was going to be on an XL, but we did, um, play around with reach and stuff like that a little bit at the start. We also played around with some rear triangle lengths and stuff like that. Um, and it's funny because what we were or what Jack was comfortable with, um, at team camp, we didn't necessarily use all year. Um, we actually, um, we ended up on, uh, a standard headset, um, where we didn't, um, have any reach adjustment or anything like that. We ended up with the, the XL front triangle, um, at team camp in January. And we ended up with the shorter seat stays, um, which effectively is a chain stay length. Um, and at the first round, because he was still coming off an injury um, that he had at team camp um, where he just punched a tree and um, broke his hand, we changed a bunch of things to make him more comfortable. And we actually stuck with a couple of those things throughout the season um, after that. And we've done, a, like we did some suspension um, testing and stuff like that uh, while we're at team camp as well with Shram. Um got a couple of uh, different setups. Like uh, there was a couple of shocks that he thought was quite good and we've sort of moved throughout those um, in the year. Um, and we've gone through uh, like a couple of different products and stuff like that that um, uh, SRAM are testing essentially. Um, so, yeah, we, we've – we haven't – at the start of the te- season, we were testing a little bit and we've done just little bits and pieces um, throughout the um, year. But um, we've basically just, Jack's been trying to get just like, uh, I guess, at one with the bike, for lack mm. of a better term. Um, and I think like the, the off season is definitely the time to test rather than in the season. And so, yeah, once, uh, once we had the start of the season was um, done. It was it was time to go racing and and not sort of like play around with too much. Mm. Kind of find out all your benchmarks first. The whole swapping That's right. and, and chain, then the whole swapping and chain stays and stuff. I found super interesting because he went with a shorter chain stay, correct? Originally, yes. Yeah, and then we um we changed that um in Medina. Um, or just before, just to add that little bit more stability to the bike um, because he was going to be a little bit um, behind. Um, mm-hmm. It just sort of like the way he rode. Um, so, yeah, we we sort of dulled down the bike a fair bit for um, Medina especially. Um, and then a, a couple of those things that we did actually just stayed on the bike, like the longer seat stays. Um, and we've pretty much run that throughout the the whole season now, but it's something that we will we'll go back to um, and try again. Um, mm-hmm. But I think something that like it's um you don't just want to necessarily test 
one thing, but you want to you want to try and do one thing at a time. But what am I trying to say? So basically, if you there could be different setups that work, um, but not just with implementing one change. It could be like a couple of things actually make a better setup. So it'd be interesting to um, play around with a few different things in the off season um, rather than just like, yeah, just implementing one, one change. Mm. With that Sort of, dif- it's not real difficult to get across. I'm sure I've just said it. So it's, doesn't make sense. <laughs> I mean, like if you're playing with chainstay links, then you've got to play with Forks' tunes because your weight mounts is all off. And then I'm guessing your rear shock also needs tuning and then your bar roll could be different. Like it's all coming, stemming off of that, that chainstay link. That's assume, right. And yeah. it, it could be a, a few clickers here and there. Um may not just be yeah may not be like a a whole tune or anything like that but yeah that's that's sort of what i'm trying to get at is like um if you have time to explore um just by like changing one thing may mean that you you require changing a few other things um it's not just a a plug and play uh, for the seat stay Mm. how many grips did you go through in that first couple of weeks of racing (laughs) uh do you know what we (laughs) we so many it was actually a bit bit ridiculous um and we probably tried three or four but we probably had i don't know seven sets of grips or something like that um but when you're like if you're used to a, a certain diameter or something like that going like too far the other way or it's like it's difficult to get used to even though it like might be better on your hand it just it just feels weird right so you're like thinking about that and just taking like a just that little bit of you've got a little bit of distraction um so yeah we didn't end up going going too crazy and change too many yeah i remember him saying that and i'm like yeah you should just try the census like the the meeting force would have been perfect but then yeah it would have been a huge change because those things are bad so yeah, well, we did have those to, to try, but we didn't end up putting them on. Mm. Yeah. Were you... It was, Sorry, go ahead. It, it was cool to see, actually. So I think, um, like, he put uh, a few things on his YouTube channel, um, sort mm. of, like, asking for uh, some advice or some grips and stuff like that. And um, it was cool to see, um, I guess, like, how many people... Um, had their input and um, yeah, we like, there was a few things that I sort of hadn't necessarily heard of and um, yeah. So we, we got a bunch of stuff and it was, it was all due to the people just helping out. That was, that was good. So many different grips. There's so many different ways to hold on to a handler. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, and people just get along with it differently. Don't they? Yeah. I can't run thin grips ever. It'll ruin my my life. Like I can't do it. <laughs> so, were you a part of the black box testing and and development for the transmission stuff that Jack may or may not have been running really early in the year? No, no, no. I had um I had nothing to do with that. Um, I'd um worked on. Uh, cleaned up one of his uh, race bikes, like Canyon race bikes at uh, maybe the start of the year or the end of last year or something like that, which had it on it. Um, I think I basically just swapped some bits and pieces out. That was sort of the first I'd um, kind of had anything to do with it. Um, so my real sort of um, dealings with it were was team camp. Really, where okay. we um, yeah, Nico there, sort of showing us the ins and outs and all that sort of stuff, and yeah, so no, no testing and development at all. Has it still been like a major benefit for you guys? Like swapping out that rear mech takes what five minutes now instead of a bit longer, or is it you had everything set up so well before that 
it didn't make a big difference? I think, um, like for for working on the bike, I don't think it makes a big difference for myself. Like, I I love the new stuff, but I think it's more the riding that good. Um, shifting under load is massively improved, um, mm. and how quiet they are as well. Um, that's not real. Like, I guess it's a little bit performance, but it's not really a performance gain. But it is because you're not hearing anything. Um, mm. so yeah, that's like, I think the two key things that are a, a massive improvement, um, and then the reliability or like the, um, serviceability of them is fantastic as well. Um, touch wood, like we, we have actually not broken or damaged anything, um, transmission wise um, yeah, right. this year um haven't even replaced the cage um i think uh sorry that's a that's a lie um we did break a um a, a tooth off a jockey wheel um but like yeah, and that could that could happen to anything like ultimately it's um a, a, like a, a plastic piece and mm. we see you know everything snap in half from, you know, frames to seat posts. Like er everything has its limit, right? 100%. So you're trying to tell me that you haven't snapped your uh, rear triangle off because of the transmission derailleur? Because apparently, according to the internet, everyone's going to snap the bike of that thing. Yeah, look, there's there's lots of of hate and there's lots of love. Like that's going to happen for anything, hasn't it? And like, some some people have like some valid points and, and bits and pieces, but not everything is always perfect in regard to like, you know, I'm sure it, SRAM is going to improve on this transmission throughout its whole life cycle. Mm. Um, like in some ways you like don't know how it's like every year someone's like oh this is like such a good bike how are they going to improve on it or particular product they typically always do sometimes there's some backward steps but um yeah like it's it's absolutely fantastic and uh like i want it on my bike i wouldn't run anything else Mm. it's pretty hard to say no to like i've worked on it for the first time the other week and i was like okay it's all made like it all made sense on the internet, but then when I worked on it, I was like, this really makes sense. Yeah. And it looks cool too, I reckon. Like Yeah. And the um the XO uh cranks and stuff like that. Like I think I only seen them for the first time uh last week. Like I, I they looked cool on the internet, but mm. um like we run all the XX stuff. Um and yeah, so I'd only seen that that XO stuff for the first time. It looks, looks sick. What's it? So I guess you guys are still running the same parts. Like it's, it's a weird setup for you guys, right? So you've got two or three riders on the team, but they can all run different parts, but all have the same frame. Is that making it harder for you guys to carry spares or? Um, in some ways, Yes, and then in some ways, no. Um, so I guess like the hard part is uh, like before all the racing happens, knowing that you've got all of the different bits and pieces like ready to go, like the amount of product that you require um, like in the in the warehouse to, to go to the races. So um yeah, you've got probably a lot more parts to actually organize, like, you know, uh, from uh, brake pads on Jack's bike to Texie's bike to Casper's bike. They're like, they're all different. Um, so that's just a simple um, thing to think about. Um, so, yeah, just remembering all that. But then on the other hand, um, mechanic has a little bit more responsibility um Mm. to make sure that you have all those parts and um 
you have sort of your parts put aside and all that sort of stuff. So, um, also, um, like I've, I've not experienced this, but like uh, another positive I see is that like you're, you're accountable. And, um, if you do run out of something, then it's on, on you. Like someone Mm -hmm. hasn't just grabbed like the last, um, set of brake pads and not told anyone or, um, like the last whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like accountability. And I think that that is good. Um, yeah, so it does have its struggles, but there is like, there's some, there's some good parts to it as well. That makes a lot of sense. Everyone's a bit more, it's like three teams, but they're all in one and you kind of working together, but also have your own unique accountability issues. Yeah. So the, the load on some people is probably higher, but it's not a harder job to do. Mm. Is everyone, it seems like everyone's quite intertwined and work really well together though as well. Like even though taxis on different brakes or different tires or whatever, and Jack's on his tires, it seems like there's a lot of swapping and testing and camaraderie between all, well, two of the main riders. And then I guess Casper's coming back soon. So he'll probably be a part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been unfortunate not to have Cappy around all season. Um, Obviously, everyone knows the the story there, um, but yeah, he'll be he'll be back at the last two rounds, so that would be really good. Um, the each individual rider knows what they want, and they're different enough that um, nothing like everyone's happy to test their own or use their own particular products, and not really like no one's trying to force someone to to try something else or, um, or if, or if one of the riders, um, was thinking of a particular product, they can then have maybe like a larger database of like knowledge and stuff like that. So Mm. you can probably pick each other's minds a little bit, um, before you even test the product. Um, yeah. So I just think like, yeah, all the riders do get along, um, really well um but yeah there's no Mm. like um yeah just trying to like i guess answer your your question properly it's like they 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 all know what they want so they're like they don't have a bunch of um like uh weird testing together or like there's not product thrown around and stuff like that it's just like yeah i guess when you're racing at that level they want the stuff they trust as well. They don't want to be messing around with everything weird and yeah. wonderful. And there's some like different uh, approaches on the team as well. So for example, Jack, like he hasn't changed too much um, throughout the year. Um, if you look at uh, Taxi's uh, bike throughout the year, a lot of the stuff hasn't changed. Like there's, um, but there's a lot of little stuff that has throughout the season. Um mm. And it's just different, different mindsets. Um, excuse me. That's right. Had a bit of a cold last week. Um, the blow my nose. That's right. work back again yep it's perfect okay cool yeah um yeah the riders have different um ways of thinking so um like jack is sort of more if i run this setup uh and then get faster on it uh whereas i think taxi um is looking for the fastest setup um, okay. But it's just the two different mindsets. Was it a weird concept when you first started, when you heard like how it's going to play out? I was, I was confident in the program straight mm. away. Um, 
because of the exact scenario that we'd had that Jack and I had had previously. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was really positive. Um, the instant thought was like just the logistics of it. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, but once I sort of recognized that that was going to be fine um, and at test camp, people didn't go absolutely crazy. Like you could, you know, try a bunch of different things, right? Like you could um, try three different sets of forks. Um, also, like you could change the shock with those manufacturers as well, or we could have something crazy like um, that you don't see very often. Like I think Casper at the moment has a Fox 36 fork um, mm-hmm. in his bike with a super deluxe, I think, uh, if I'm correct, um, still in his um, uh, rear shock for his bike. So, yeah, you could have gone crazy with various different combinations and, and stuff like that, but um, I think everyone was fairly fairly sensible and had a good idea of what they wanted to actually try. I thought it was super, super smart because YT don't make components, so it doesn't matter. Like, they're not there. Oh, surely a bit of advertising and money coming into the team from the products wouldn't hurt but if you got three yt frames on the podium and they're all running different gear it's got more to say about the yt bike than it does about anything else yeah and i think it's it's good for um brands and stuff like that too isn't it like um if the the winning bike um has those products and stuff on it um, and they've they've chosen it. They could choose anything. I think that's a, a pretty positive thing. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's a it's a bold move um, by YT because they're um, supporting the team throughout the whole the whole year. Um, and um, you know, supporting that program. So that means like purchasing a lot of parts that essentially would have been given. Um, yeah. in most circumstances um, and probably money that goes along with that in, in like with some sponsors. Um, yeah, I, it's it's such a, a cool thing to be part of and I don't know whether more people will do it or not. Like it, it's not the, mm. the normal way about things, but um, that's the cool thing about YT is that it's not always the, the same mold as everyone else. I mean, you don't have to use Sharpies either. Like you're not there sharpening out tire logos and doing everything else. So it's a win-win for yeah. everyone. Yeah, definitely. That doesn't work anyway. You end up getting in trouble. No oh, matter what, so. Yeah. You can't yeah. black out yellow. Like it never works. <laughs> <laughs> no, especially like on the sidewall where it just gets scratched off and stuff like yeah. that as well. So good. Um, we well, might actually wind things back a bit here. And we're kind of jumping all over the place, but um, I wanted to know how you kind of got into wrenching and and how it all began, or even bikes. Mm-hmm. And then... Yeah. Um, so I did my trade as a motor mechanic, um, okay. so cars um, back yep. in Oz, um, and I didn't really enjoy that so much. Um, and but I I did my trade and. I sort of stuck around for a little bit longer, but I knew it wasn't going to be a long-term thing for me. Like I just couldn't work on cars. Um, like I'm a pretty small guy too. So like lifting gearboxes and stuff like that, even though you've got like all these big stands and stuff, it was always like pretty difficult. Um, and yeah, the, like uh, it was just time for me to step away and a, a mate um, reached out to a bike shop that he used to work at. Um, and, uh, they, they basically took me on and, um, yeah, this must've been 12 years ago or something like that. And, uh, yeah, just absolutely loved it. Um, it's it's like, I've always ridden bikes and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, just got along with it really well. Um, went through, I sort of like worked in a few different stores and stuff like that. I think that's super important too, because as much as changing job and stuff like that, um, 
I didn't, I didn't change jobs frequently, but like every few years, like maybe three, four years or something like that. Um, but you learn so much from other mechanics and the way different places work. It doesn't matter what mm-hmm. industry you're in. Um, so I think that like you gain a lot of knowledge and that mine was like, I worked in like stores that pre- predominantly like mountain bike orientated and then road orientated and, um, yeah, just like you, you just learn uh, a bunch about like different products. Like you learn different tricks from different mechanics and stuff like that. And also like just getting along with, uh, different groups of people as well. And that's something that's like super important that you can relate to the, the world cup. Um, Mm -hmm. just because you're on a team with someone, um, doesn't necessarily mean that you're like, you know, they would be your friend outside of like work and stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, just learning all those skills like that were mechanically minded, but also that you can, that you get from just like life experience. Um, so yeah, but basically that's, that's how I sort of, um, started in the bike industry and then um honestly i think like right place right time sort of thing when i started working with jack is like i grew up in similar kind of area um we knew each other but more knew of each other like um Mm -hmm. uh, there's a few years uh like gap so i i seen jack from basically the the start kind of thing like uh racing at a wobber and stuff like that and uh but we've got like mutual friends um at newly um jake newell he's yeah. uh, a family friend like i've been close to their family for a long time um so yeah just sort of he needed a mechanic and i was available um you also need to be on well most times you're on a pretty poor wage for your first year because you just want to kind of get in the door and and cut your teeth kind of thing. Um, so you need to be willing to, I guess, work for peanuts, um, <laughs> to start off with. Um, so I was just in a position where I could do that and, uh, things just aligned. So that's how I got my first role, um, with Jack basically. I think, yeah, what you said about like moving shops and learning different things and being with different mechanics is such a big plus like you learn so much from each different mechanic in a different shop and there's always different ways of managing the workshop or parts you can take a bit from everyone and use it yourself it's it's a bigger thing yeah definitely and and the age of the different mechanics and stuff like that or like their their experience like um so i guess like um when I first started or like the first store I worked in, um, the own, it was a very small company. I think there was just the three of us at, um, uh, when I first started there and he'd run that store for a, a bunch of years. So he had like that kind of, um, experience of, you know, when you had to, um, face everything out of the box and, or like, Mm. It, you know, you might have even got like a, a front, like build up frames and stuff like that. Um, but then there was a lot of stuff that I missed out in, in that store. Like, um, you know, as much as we were a, a mountain bike store and we did like a lot of like XC trail stuff. So there wasn't like much downhill, which is in a lot of stores um, or like not in a lot of stores. Yeah. But we didn't have hardly anything to do with road either. And not that that's absolutely necessary, but it just widens your um, repertoire, I guess. And also like the way you think about things when you're like working on different products. Like it, I think thinking back, like a lot of the tech used to come from um, the roadside or like the roadside would yeah. get like updated and everything first. And then we would see it trickle across the mountain bike. Mm. Whereas I think a lot of, like they're actually they take a lot of stuff from mountain bike nowadays and implement that in like the road group sets and stuff like that um 
yeah. and it's not always like just just like one way but um yeah i just think that you just learn um a lot of bits and pieces and the more you can widen that the, the better you're going to be i think road is road bikes and tt bikes and that stuff is very interesting because they're so basic and you're trying to squeeze out speed from them without having much to deal with like there's no suspension there's nothing there like the it's so hard to script squ- it's literally marginal gains with everything and i think that's super interesting and fun when it comes to working on road yeah yeah and there's um i guess you in some ways you ex- yeah experience like uh things uh quicker than the mountain bike like internal cable routing and stuff like that and especially like through the handlebars and headsets and stuff like that so yeah you kind of just have yeah you just see things and how they work and stuff like that um a little quicker work like yeah i wouldn't have seen that stuff um for probably uh, a year or so um really if i was working in that same store mm-hmm. um like and like there would be people that had a year's experience on that sort of stuff before I did. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, it's just, it's just nice to, to move around a little bit. Did you do any wrenching race wise before Jack or was he the first time you kind of went overseas and did anything? Um, I think I'd worked at a few events before. Um, okay. So yeah, I'd worked at like a um, Noosa Triathlon, which was actually absolutely crazy. Um, people yeah, you can have that. not, yeah, yeah. There was there was one particular um, person that he he did the Noosa Triathlon each year, and that was like the only time he rode his bike. So we did a bunch of work, like maybe I don't know, eight hundred bucks worth of stuff or something like that, Aussie dollars, so like four quid. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, we did yeah a bunch of stuff to his bike and he's like yeah I didn't ride this since like the last uh, Noosa triathlon last year and I was just like wow dude um, but it was it was cool because like he was only there for fun like there was no no pressure or anything like that but um, just that's the kind of stuff that you were getting at these events um, and anything like from just the tube to you know a, a massive amount of work um, but I'd worked at mountain bike events and stuff previously, but never for like one person. Yeah. Um, and then we had a couple of lead up races, um, uh, before getting to a world cup that year. So we had, uh, nationals down in bright. Um, and we also did an access cup, um, in Maribor the week before the world cup. Um, so I had sort of like a soft sort of, um, yeah. soft opening to that. Yeah. Did you do any work with Lockie, Lockie McKillop? Or just uh, no? Yes. Yeah, so I, I worked with him um, at a store in Sydney, uh, okay. or two stores actually, um, but never like sort of, uh, oh, we might have gone to an event or something like that. Um, I can't really can't really remember. But, yeah, I, I um, rode my bike, raced with Lockie. Um, I lived with him for a bunch of years. Um, oh, sick. And yeah, we worked worked in the same store for or the same couple of stores for a bunch of years as well. So yeah, yeah no lucky well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I remember him saying he worked at like he did something and he was talking about you. So I was Do you know what? He's actually he's been instrumental in uh my career with Jack as well. Um sorry, Lucky, I uh forgot to mention that. Um but he, won't he mind. sort of connected the <laughs> he connected the dots there. Um as well, actually, and um, uh, yeah, we're in, we're in Whistler having a conversation um, about um, the intense team and stuff like that. This is before, like in two, must have been two thousand eighteen. So that was early on in the year, and um, yeah, he was he was instrumental in connecting um, Jack and I as well, um, and then he's also uh, just been really really helpful, like with his. Um, SRAM gig, like obviously great, great sort of contact, but um, 
he just like with the stew and all that sort of stuff, like, um, yeah, had me down to, to check all, all that out. And I, I took part in the course a bunch of years ago and stuff like that. So yeah, he's just been massively helpful and, um, a, a good dude. It kind of brings you back to like the, another part of working in different stores and different parts of the industry is like having those connections and meeting people and, like it's just this giant web of of mates in some ways. Like it's all um, that's how most of the bike shop jobs come about, or you just hear it from someone else. You never see one advertised, but there's always people yeah. getting new jobs. Yeah, um, that's right, and it, like that's that's good and bad. Like obviously, I've been on the positive end of that quite a bit. Um, it doesn't lend itself necessarily to professionalism um or or having necessarily the right person for the right job all of the time (laughs) um but yeah like it's also yeah it's also very handy sometimes too isn't it like Mm. um yeah so you can't can't really hate on it when you've been on like the the positive side of it um but yeah i do think there's definitely room to improve especially at a at a shop level um rather than just sort of i think that like teaching a, a a kid and stuff like that is is super positive um like a junior that wants to to work in the industry um but providing the teachings coming from the right person too mm. it is a weird dynamic within the industry that way like there is a very big lack of professionalism in a lot of shops. And it just seems it like it's a bunch of mates working on bikes still. Yeah, in in some some, some sure. stores. Yeah. Um but yeah, it is it is like and to be uh positive about that, that that is is changing and I think it's gonna improve massively from the top with all of these motorcycle industry um people coming into the e-bike world um i think that's gonna like it'll take a long time but um i think everything's going to improve um from from the bottom and from the top it it's a much more professional industry even even compared to when i got into it it's definitely getting better it's slow, but it's definitely getting better. Yeah. Um, yeah. What are your plans for the rest of the year? So you've got Ludenville coming up. What else is, is kind of on? Is it just EWS stuff you guys are, are doing? Yeah. So um, we're actually going to go to, I think, Andorra and watch the, the downhill. Um, That's sick. Because that pair is pretty, pretty, co- uh, pretty close to... Um, uh, Ludenbjell. Um, the I think we're going to do like sort of a week um of riding, um, which I earlier mentioned. Um, I think that's sort of around Leger or something like that, or maybe um Morzine. Um, yeah, head down to Andorra, check that out, and then we've got the the next two races um after that. So. Uh, that's sort of our next block. It'll take about sort of five to six weeks. Mm. Um, and then after that, um, we'll just have to sort of see what happens for uh, myself. Um, I'm actually coming to Oz in November um, for a bit of a holiday, um, see see family. But, um, yeah, for Jack, um, I'm sure he'll keep plenty busy with uh, like YouTube channel and stuff like that. But, it will be the off season, so he'll have a bit of downtime as well. Um, so yeah, it's not not too much after the next couple of races. Yeah, it's very condensed season this year. Like I keep forgetting that like, everything's pretty much already happened in the last like six to eight weeks. Yeah, it was. It did feel like that, but then if um, if you think about it, like it was all the way back in sort of March that um, we had the races in um medina and and derby um so 
yeah i think like it it is still fairly stretched out but with the the blocks being like well the last block being super intense um mm. yeah it's a that's exactly what it does feel like and uh, i think it's only going to be more intense next year by the look of the proposed calendar that's wild hey like it's so yeah. packed in there <laughs> it's so yeah. packed and it endure world champs yeah. possibly yeah yeah that that looks looks positive for a, a world champs unfortunately didn't didn't get that this year um but yeah hopefully next year it's it's all good yeah that'll be cool to watch for sure. I did like the Trophy of Nations, though. I did like that format. Yeah, it was it was cool, but I like to be honest, I didn't I didn't follow it too much. I like the kind of um the kind of basing around like the MX of Nations or like similar to mm. to the way they do it, how like you it is a team and like an, a nation kind of effort. But um Correct me if I'm wrong. You didn't really have a like a one-off result so much, did you? In the Trophy of Nations, like one particular rider no. doesn't necessarily win. Is that correct? I don't think so. Yeah, no, I think you're correct on that. Yeah, which is which a bit weird. I, yeah, yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that, but um, mm. yeah, that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> it's still rad though. Like I would love to to go and watch it. Yeah, and like the I think last one was finale. Um mm. and yeah, that's a super cool place. Like to be so close to the beach and stuff like that. And then I think the terrain is like kind of similar to what we mm. what you can have in, in Oz. Like it rides like pretty pretty close. Um, so as an Aussie, that's like a really cool place. What's the uh, best place you reckon you've been to this year, event-wise, so far? Um, do you know what? I think Medina. Um, Dude, that's and- like, I'm so... That was the most amount of FOMO I've had ever. I should have gone to that. Oh, no. Yeah, didn't get there. No. Yeah. I was devastated. Yeah, um, yeah it, was a, it was a combination of things like... Um, the Finnish um, sort of area um, had such a good vibe and it was like a sort of a stadium sort of finish. Um, so that was really good, better than I think any of the other um, events that have happened this year. Um, so that was good. Um, the tracks were um, fantastic. Mm. Um, and it was it was quite laid back because a lot of the teams don't have like a big – professional setup or anything like that so um i think there was a lot more mingling um like because yeah people were just in open tents and like it was very small and stuff like that so um yeah overall i think and i think they also put on a really good event the event village like with all the sort of cafe food bike shop area and stuff down the bottom there it was fantastic um DJs and but, free beer because they didn't have a license to sell it. And oh, really? <laughs> I just didn't get in, in on that, but um, yeah. that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, the actual, like, some of the scenery and stuff like that, like Val de Fassa is, um, is right up there. Um, that, was, that was really cool. Um, yeah, finale, like, with the, the ocean and then the, the mountains, like, right there. That's cool. There's like there's positives with every single race, um, mm. and area that you go to. But um, I think Medina just because of the the vibe and the the finish arena really made it like good. It's crazy for such a little town in the middle of nowhere to be so damn good at putting on an event. Yeah, yeah. The um the guys that that run or the people that run um. Medina, like, so, sure know how to um put on an event. I I haven't been, but the um the enduro uh, jam festival enduro jam yeah um like is meant to be one of the the best uh, events each year. So it, be keen to get to that in the next year or two. It's so chill. It's basically like just going for a giant group ride. It's such a such a good event. 
definitely have to come down for it. Yeah, that would be cool. I was hoping maybe this year because we were meant to be uh, in Oz for December, um, but that's it's got pushed forward to November. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, next year. Next year we'll be sick. Fingers crossed. <laughs> it's so good watching, like, you know, Troy following Aaron and all the Forbidden Boys just doing trains and everyone just – it was just like, yeah, watching people ride. Instead of racing, it was it was really cool. Aaron's good on a bike, eh? He always uh, he's good to good to watch. Always gets a little bit loose as well. <laughs> he is the definition of pull up, not out. Like he is a hundred percent the guy that just goes, ah, we'll see what happens. It is wild to watch him ride a bike. Scary, it. and it, yeah, there's always like it, there shouldn't be. But there's always this element of um, pressure when you've got like uh, Troy or Jack or or someone like that um, behind you as well, um, and like they don't expect anything from us, but there's still that little bit of pressure. I dropped into Medina and had like Baxter and all the local crew like following me once, and I lasted yep. probably like two or three hundred meters. Like fuck this pressure, I'm off, and pulled over. Like this is too much. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a weird one, isn't it? But yeah, it, I want to see a race of mechanics. Actually, like I'd love to see mechanics world champs. That would nah. be that would be cool. No beer drinking though, like the the boxer worlds and stuff. Like I watched that. Um, oh, I watched the first round. Um, that was really cool. But they were like having a shot whiskey and stuff like that at the the start of it. Yeah, and n- no good. Absolutely no. <laughs> no, if they just did yeah, like yeah. a proper mechanic and the rider had to wrench on the bike or something, like that would be sick. Put put the put the wheels on or something like that, like a Le Mans start. Put mm. the put the wheels on and had to like bring the bike to the rider or something like that. And then and the time starts at the, the start. Something yeah. ridiculous. But like Aaron. Yeah. And then you got Anthony Paulson, um, who was at World Champs. And then <laughs> um, Bedwards, what's his name? Uh, ben Edwards, I think his name is from Pivot, like entering whip off and stuff. Like oh, so really? many I good didn't riders. See that. Yeah, he does the whip off and like proper goes goes huge. Like he's really, really oh, good that's, rider. That's so I saw so Anthony many. racing worlds. Yeah. He's he's too good. We should make it happen because he was he was riding uh, he was like racing for uh, Kona or something like that, wasn't it? Um, uh, back mm. a few years ago. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's cool. how he got involved with the team, and then kind of got over racing, I believe, and yeah, kept him on. Nice. Still rips. It's ridiculous. Uh, um, might start wrapping things up here a bit. I'll let you get on with your day. Uh, what is some advice you'd give to anyone wanting to become a bike mechanic and then make their world on make their way onto the World Cup? Um, I think is just get experience. Um, like uh, there's different ways about it. Um, for for what I spoke about earlier. Um. Like once you're already in the store, um, you know, I don't want to say just change for the the hell of it, but like you need to do good time in each store. So you, you repay them the effort for, um, you know, them essentially giving you your job. Um, but get, get experience. Um, maybe go do events or something like that. If you don't want to change workplaces and just try and change the people that you work with a little bit to, to just gain different tips and tricks and knowledge. Um, but there is other ways about it. I know um, Sam, who I, it was uh, Nico's mechanic in 2019, um, he really wanted to work on the World Cup. And so he approached um, uh, Todd, the team manager, and basically he said, uh, you require more experience before we can take you on. I think this was 
Todd might have been with Norco or something like that a few years previous. And um, so they had him along to a couple of races and he was doing some like background stuff, changing tires and bits and pieces. And then he went and worked in the store, like I think in New Zealand. So he was from the UK. He, he moved halfway across the world um, mm. and just gained that sort of like downhill experience uh, working on like that sort of bikes because they're big in like you know, mm. Christchurch and stuff. Um, so there's not one way to do it, but my advice is just gain experience. Yeah. Work hard and, and learn harder. Do That's you- right. You can still have a great time while you're, uh, while you're doing that. Yeah. Uh, is there anything you would have done differently or, or regret in up until now? Um, Probably uh, there's there's always things that you could change to do things better, but regret, no. Mm. Um, like, yeah, not every decision that you make is perfect along the way, is it? But um, no, there's nothing I, I necessarily regret or I've like particularly done uh, in a wrong way. Um, I probably, yeah, no, yeah. I would say. I, I'm pretty comfy with with the way I've done things. And uh, if you are at a race and it's like pissing down with the rain, or something's gone wrong and you don't really want to deal with it, or you know you're just trying to find some motivation, how do you kind of get motivated to do something? Is there like music or anything you listen to, or how do you kind of go about that? Do you think in like a, a race scenarios in like uh, like I'm working at a World Cup or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Like if you're working, and, yeah. you know, you've pulled a big night and you really need to get motivated the next day or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I'm a, a fairly big routine person. So uh, as long as I get my uh, coffee in the morning, it doesn't have to be a good one. I can, <laughs> I prefer a good one, but it could be an instant. Um, but I like to always have a coffee before I like leave the hotel or, um, or you know, uh, Airbnb, whatever it may be, um, coffee, and um, I'm I'm there to to do a job and do a really good job, and I get paid for that. So I just have to remind myself that um, as much as sometimes it can be bad or it can be really good, um, you might want to go bike riding or something like that. But if things need to be done, you just need to remember that you're there for work. Mm. That'd be pretty so tough, I, I think, for some to... people. Like, if you got, you know, Andorra or Morzine or something sitting right at your front door and you go to work, like, that's going to be tough for a few people. Yeah. And sometimes it's in the preparation phase that you could easily uh, go for a bike ride and maybe, like, um, put something off. But preparation is is where you do well as, as a mechanic or even, like, for the rider. Um, so... I think that, yeah, like this, for example, when we're, um, uh, yeah, I think we're actually going to be in Morzine or Leger or something in a couple of weeks. Um, when I'm there, if there's things to be done, like I don't go bike riding until those, mm. those things are done. Um, and it's just, yeah, you can, well, I was going to say you can. There's some people that do get lost in that. Um, but I think, like, I'm just lucky that I'm sort of like, I'm not old, but I'm old enough now and into my career that I can just recognize that when things need to to get done. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's a good place place to end on. Um, yeah, cheers. Yeah. Thanks so much for coming on and having a chat and, and fitting this into your schedule. Uh, I really appreciate it. No worries. Thanks for having me. Easy, man. Well, uh, yeah, take it easy and uh, good luck for the rest of the season. Okay, cheers. Hopefully it's perfect. not too late for you. I haven't checked the time. No, it's only 8 o'clock. It's all right. Ah, perfect. Yeah, I've got an all-nighter tomorrow, so. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I hope you enjoyed that chat we had with Major Pain. Super interesting guy, super interesting chat, and I uh, hope he motivated a little bit to get out there and, and experience the bike industry. 
As per usual, thanks to our sponsors, Trek Bikes, Frank Mountain Bike Apparel, Shred Bike Care, Fist Handwear, Taylor Trails, Lead Out Sports, Dirt Surfer, Capped Out Caps, and Oakley. These guys keep the podcast going. If you want to keep the potty going yourself, jump over to beyondthetape.com, chuck some money in the account. If you don't have any cash and you don't want to spend any cash, uh, tell your mum, tell your nana, tell your dog, tell your goat, tell whoever, and uh, share the podcast around. Plus review it. That also helps a fair bit from what I've heard. Anyway, thanks for listening. And until next time, just go out and have a bunch of fun.